And it's a lively debate this morning. We're joined by the News Channel and we're on BBC Two. We are in Sunderland, an amazing audience with all sorts of different views, but everybody does have a view on what is happening to our country at the moment and in our country at the moment. What's it like living through this uh, cost of living, the cost of living problem? Some call it the cost of living crisis. What, what is it like having to deal with it at the moment? Hi, Eleanor. Good morning to you. Tell me about your situation in life. Hi, so um, I have a daughter who has Down syndrome. Um, we have made some changes. We, we kind of looked at our um, costs in the household and we did have to make some changes, whether it was food, heating. Uh, she has kind of sensory needs around her food, so we can't just totally cut things out and change things there. Uh, we can't afford to just have the heating off because she has a history of getting quite ill and things as well. Um, but above that, one of the things that I do is uh, volunteer with a charity that we set up to help families with school uniform. Um, That's a big problem, a big problem and challenge for people at the moment, isn't it? But it's, it's all about it's all about kind of self-esteem at school, being like your peers, isn't it? Absolutely. And whether you miss out on education. So when children were going back to school in September, uh, we had a family get in touch. Um, and it was actually the auntie of this child. And she con con contacted me and said, can you help my niece? She hasn't been able to go back to school because her mum can't afford her school uniform. She is missing out on her education. Her mum, she clothed her two younger children with, with their school uniform. She works, so to go back to kind of the arguments about people working, she works hard. She could not afford the cost of the school uniform. And as a result, her daughter was missing out on her education. That is not right in any, any way is that right at all. And what about, it's your son, isn't it, who's... Uh... My daughter. Sorry, I do apologize. And what's it like with the heat in the house and keep it, keep having to keep things warm? We, we just... So she, she has a history of pneumonia. If she gets ill, she goes downhill very quickly. Um, and we know that kind of keep, keeping her, her warm just helps keep her safer. So we, we can't just say, well, everyone put an extra jumper on. We have to make sure that it is keeping warm. Obviously, as it goes into winter, through the night it gets colder. We look at ways to kind of keep her room warm, um, even if we're not keeping the rest of the house warm. Uh, we, we are in the situation where we can um, manage with that, but we have had to make, make some adaptations. We obviously, so she gets DLA. We obviously got the um, additional payment there. It's not going to go a massive, uh, a massive amount, but it did kind of help towards all those costs. Okay. Yeah, sorry I uh, said son uh, rather than daughter, <laughs> but you, you put it up really well. Hi, hi Carla, how are you doing? Welcome. Um, I, I tend to, I've got a small heater and I tend to um, uh, carry it around wh whichever room I go into kind of thing. I can't afford to put my heating on. Um, I live on £250 per month. <laughs> you know, um, when you pay for broadband and then you've got uh, food and all the rest of it, it doesn't leave very much. Um, I'm just very lucky that I've got friends that uh, will take me out and um, make sure that everything... Sorry. Oh, it's um, all right. Absolutely right. It's so tough for people at the moment. Yeah. I completely understand. But you've got friends who, Which, are, who are helping you. Yeah. You can't, you can't be having amazing friends, can you? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's just not good enough. 
you know. What, what needs to happen? What needs to change? And who needs to change it? Well, the government, basically, because at the end of the day, um, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to do it? Um, I've got two cats. I don't have any children, thank goodness. Um, God knows what I'd, what I'd be doing if, if it was up to, to having to clothe and feed a child. I wouldn't be able to do it. Mm. Can I ask your politics? I mean, what, what's your, your own... I voted pol- for, for Bojo um, because uh, I voted for Brex- Brexit. Mm. So, so that's that. But um, what, what made you do that? Did you think, well, we need something new, we need something different? Well, why, by, why be spending money um, overseas and stuff like that when we need it over here? Do you miss Boris Johnson? Do you think if he were in charge, things might be different still? I know that he was in the wrong to do what he did with the parties and all the rest of it. But then again, who didn't? I bet you there were a lot of people... <laughs> yeah, but... I'm... Sorry, Christine, what? We had par- uh, not parties like he did, but um, my birthday party, we yeah. were at the front of the house, tables, everybody was separate. Do you know what? It's an interesting little diversion, uh, and I had some incredible phone-ins on, <laughs> on the whole party situation. Let's take it back to now. I appreciate you mentioning that, because you say that he had his faults, but, you know, what do you well, think there's... of... What, go on, Carl. Well, at least he managed to get things done. Did he? OK. Whereas you, you look at Liz Truss, what is she doing? Anyone want to hear a good response to that? Oh, we jo- look, on, look on the screen, everybody. We're joined by Paul Scully, the uh, business secretary. Uh, yeah, is that am I right saying that? Just on something? No? I'm Minister for Local Government now, Nicky. All right, sorry. So moved away from this, Changes yeah. on a daily basis, Paul. I, I, <laughs> are you the yeah. Chancellor yet? I'm going to ask you that. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. And it's all fair that we gave Jonathan Reynolds a, a round of applause earlier on for joining us. Let's be politically balanced here. Welcome. Right? <laughs> What a Kazi, your party at the moment. What an absolute embarrassing mess. Look, Nikki, things that, we know things are really difficult. For, for you've just, we've just been hearing uh, that, those, those stories, and that's going to be replicated up and down the country. And that's why we are doing everything we can to uh, to put in the energy price guarantee that uh, that is there, that started, that people are starting to see the benefits from that. But now it's that's only for six months. It is because what we want to do, we want to use those six months to make sure that it could be targeted rather than having one blanket um, uh, reaction that we did at the beginning. If we can have something that's more targeted at people like Eleanor and other uh, uh, other people that really need that help rather than more wealthy people that are somewhat insulated from, from the uh, the situation, that's that's got to be all for the good because it means that the people that are suffering most will see the biggest benefit and that's what I think we all agree should happen. You were singing the praises of Liz Truss, saying that her plan was just what the nation needed. I was reading an article from the uh, London Evening Standard that you wrote. You were you were singing her praises from the rooftops. Um, do you stand by that? Well, the fact what, what I'm saying there is, we needed to change because you go through the same process. We could see how things were building up. These kind of issues were building up, and then yeah, if you have the same. Uh, solutions. You're going to end up with the same results. So we needed to try and uh, break that. So that's that's been scuppered now, Paul, hasn't it? It has. It has. No, absolutely. Was it a mistake to scupper it? No, I think, you know, I think we've got to, there's two things that are within her plan. And one thing absolutely remains is that drive for growth. Why? Because as well as giving this initial support now to tackle the issues that we've just been hearing about, we've got to make sure that um, that we grow more resilience into the but Everybody economy. says that, broadly speaking, that they want growth, they it want does, a more successful economy. That's, what I mean so that's, a, that's, that's the... a nebulous, meaningless statement. Oh, well, her central philosophy is the drive for growth. Find a well, politician, and there are some on the fringes that say, actually, I don't want growth. Well, look, I mean, the, sta- the statement is, but it's, the, but it's the, what you're doing about it that isn't. And actually, um, productivity in this country has been comparatively slow compared to other countries because of transport issues, because of infrastructure is too slow to st- get started and start building. 
uh, we're, we're developing investment zones to actually have a stimulus in, in particular areas around the country. There's been hundreds uh -huh. of applications by councils up and down the country. But I know that people need the support now. They can't wait for that growth. They want to make sure that they can pay their energy bills. Hence, we've got the energy price guarantee. We, we heard that bills were going to be going up for a typical household, an average household, something like six and a half thousand pounds a year. That's, well, there is a problem no about, Paul, there's a problem, of course, for people and extreme concern for people after six months, what will happen then? There is massive anxiety for people, panic for a lot of people about the ending, perhaps, of the, uh, of the triple uh, lock as well. And all the things, I'm going to get some people to ask you uh, questions here. Mm. And there's lots of people who were uh, very much against uh, Liz, Liz Truss's, in the studio, very much against Liz Truss's whole political philosophy. Are they the enemies of, are they the anti-growth coalition? No, no. I mean, because when she, you're she had a about... sort of Trumpian list of enemies that she listed, and uh, I'm just wondering yeah, if any I mean, of these people were I think in there that. Were, no, no. If you're just talking about the triple lock, you're talking about these other things. Of course, they're of course they're not. But uh, but there are people who will, as I say, just try and keep the status quo. And if you try, I used to run businesses, small businesses. I, I was self-employed. The reason I was self-employed is I could disrupt the the kind of sectors that I was involved in. So as Two, two of us running a small business was winning uh, businesses off uh, really big sized businesses because we were doing something different. So I got you. So it's, it's, the, the, it's mindset, the mindset. Mindset. Thing mindset. To, the people against dynamism. So the other day, just very quickly, um, David Attenborough. Who admires David Attenborough here in the studio? But clap if you admire David Attenborough. <laughs> and you, Paul? He said, anyone who says we can have growth after growth after growth, given our finite resources, is mad. Is David Attenborough part of the anti-growth coalition? No, it's not. It's not about because it's, it's how you can grow sustainably. And what you've seen over the last 10 years in particular is the growth to, you know, of renewables within this country. The fact that we've actually finally woken up to the need for more renewable energy. The fact okay. that the UK is actually leading off offshore uh, wind, for example, and battery technologies is, is to be applauded. That's creating new jobs. Got so you. that's growth. It's both sustainable. So, but if there's a balance and if the, the environment is cared for as well and biodiversity, the two yeah. can be uh, bedfellows, if you like. Right, listen, I think you had a similar chunk to Jonathan there. I think that's fair enough. So thank you for being there, Paul. We've got some questions, as we had questions for Jonathan. And so Kerry, right in front of the screen there. Kerry, that, that's Kerry there. What would you like to ask uh, Paul? Morning, Paul. Um, do you no, I actually feel ashamed that I seen a segment on the news last night and a 65-year-old woman was crying because she couldn't use a toaster. That lady over there has just been crying about the cost of living. Are you not ashamed of a party that our older generation are crying in fear of how they're going to survive and live? Are you not ashamed of that? Look, it's not about being ashamed. It's about trying to work out how I can act. I really hate the fact that there are people suffering the way that you've just described. Uh, I didn't see that piece. Um, and we've got to do something about it. We can't just sit there and... been in power for 12 more, more... years. How can, you do, how can you say we're trying to do something? You have been well, in because... power for 12 years. Kerry, what we haven't had in those 12 years, uh, you know, in the lead-up to those, we haven't had two years when we basically switched off the We've had 12 economy. years of austerity. No, but we are, we are, but we're literally turned, every single country in the world turned off their economy effectively for two years. We spent four hundred and eight. Can you just change the same drivel over and over again by blaming Ukraine <laughs> and blaming Russia and blaming COVID? You have been in power for twelve years. Forty percent of children in the northeast live in poverty. Are you not I'm, ashamed of that? No, Kerry, what I'm saying to you is that we're trying to act targeting our support towards those people. Now, having just <laughs> hot, hot, nearly half you a trillion... You need to be on a stage as a clown. You have not got a clue. You want to come and live All in right. the North East? OK, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. You steady, steady. Yeah, fair dues. Sure. Have, a, have, a, have a robust exchange, uh, 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 you know. Yes, I, 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 I know you're upset. Have a robust exchange, but let's hear what Paul has to say in response. And there's other people who want to ask questions. I'll tell you what, Paul, I'll move, if, if I may, to somebody else who wants to ask a question. And it was uh, your good self. Kayleigh. I um, can't see your, your name. Kaylee. Kaylee, hi. How hi. are you doing? Um, I just can't stand this whole narrative of growth and growth. Like, who is it actually growing money for? Like, yeah, it grows money for the CEOs, the big bosses in the buildings. You know, you've got, we've lifted the cap and bankers' bonuses. How's that going to affect me? How's that going to affect people on benefits? How's that going to affect people? Yeah, but I know you're saying in front of me, you've got the, the councillor saying in front of me, it's going to bring more people in. Yeah, but it's that's trickle-down economics. That doesn't work, does it? It doesn't, yeah. 
to the treasury. Yeah, okay, what about the people who can't heat their homes? People who can't heat their homes. It's not for us. Like, you know, then you've got energy companies. Their profits aren't being taxed. You've got £7 billion on energy, energy companies. All right, Kayleigh, fair dues. Let's uh, let, let Paul... I mean, Paul's come to the wicket. Let's, let's see what he has to say. Yeah, no, if we, if, if the way we need to approach growth is not about just enriching a few CEOs. It's about making sure that we can get people good jobs uh, sustainable jobs, people that can work more hours are able to work more hours. I don't should think it's the right that the state should be topping up people's pension, um, people's incomes when employers could be doing so because the employers are getting away with not paying uh, good enough wages in some areas. We need to do more about that. So I was, for example, in Ebbsfleet in Kent a couple of weeks ago looking at uh, one of the proposed in investment zones down there. That attracts new businesses in there. It attracts international money as well as money from around the country. New homes, new jobs for the people of Kent. So it's about working in collaboration, not trickle down. It's not just sort of um, some uh, pat on the head platitudes to, 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 to ordinary hardworking people. This is something that we want to build sustainable. Can you do it? Everybody. I mean, the, I suppose the political question is, can you, can, will people see the difference in the two year time frame Challenge. between now and the election? And will people yeah. stick with Liz Truss? And uh, will you stick with Liz Truss? Thank you very much, Kayleigh. Let's get a couple more. If you don't mind, um, Paul, uh, no, here's no. Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Tell, us, tell me, first of all, about your life at the moment and the benefits that you're on. Um, I'm a single mum uh, with an ASD son, and I'm on ESA. And and, which was a legacy benefit, and mm. on um, PIP, low rate PIP. Um, my son doesn't get any money for his... He used to get DLA, but he doesn't anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to drive, pay for a new car to drive him to Shields to college every day. And um, I'm struggling. I really... It's getting to the point where I can't really afford the petrol. Um, I'm relieved he's off today because of this because I can't afford the petrol. I had to get a car so I could drive him there. Buses are being bad. The metro's off at the moment and he can't go on his own because he has dyslexia and can't understand the timetables, things like that. So I have to stay there while he's through Shields for college because he can't, has to have somebody to pick him up at the moment because of safeguarding and things. And um, I just can't afford petrol and things. And it's getting, where the food's getting more expensive, it's almost doubled. We don't drink, we don't smoke. Nobody in the house does. My mum's on her pension and my sister's not being it well. And people think that if you're disabled, you're lazy and you're not. I thought you were, we were chatting beforehand. I mean, everyone find this uh, interesting and indeed disturbing. Just when we were all sitting down and having a cup of coffee, you were telling me you were a bit shaken when you came in because you said, you know, the cab driver who, who brought you here today. T tell everybody what he was saying. Lou was saying that about people being on universal credit and he said about disabled people should be able to work, they can do something, whether, no matter what it is. And I had felt I had to justify myself. Oh, are you OK? Sorry. I'm really sorry. No, don't worry. By the fact I've been in pain for 24 hours a day for the past for over 20 years, and I, I want to work. Well, it just shows you the business and sure, everything. Just it just shows, shows you there's some some harsh attitudes there from people. I wonder where those those attitudes come from, and you know what right he had to say that to you when you were you coming. He doesn't know about your life, does he? He doesn't know, know anything. Do you, do you come across that a lot? Quite often, yes. I think that we're lazy, and other people if. They can't work, we should be working. And it's not that you don't want to. My sister and I tried our own business, but we couldn't manage it. So what about, and I'm, you don't have to, I'm asking people about their politics. And when, when I do do that, you can, you can tell me to, uh, to go away in no uncertain terms. But I, I am interested where people are at the moment, where they were before and where they might be in the future. What about Europe? Where did you vote? I voted Conservative because I don't like, um, I don't like his Starmer. I don't trust him. I don't trust any of them, but I suppose Boris, at least, he was a bumbling fool, but at least he did get some things sorted out. But, and he did promise with benefits and pensions. Did you like something about him? Yeah. Not that much, no. <laughs> a little bit more than Liz Truss, because she's just a Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. OK, nice. Paul, you're here. You're meant to be here for people like uh, Amanda. You heard what happened to Amanda on the way here. Appalling. Yeah. Those sorts of attitudes, utterly it, it reprehensible. But you're here for her. 
what are you going to, what, what would you say to Paul? I know he's, you can see him on the screen over there. Why would the rather disabled people be dead? <sighs> We're not animals, we've got bills to pay, we've got well, children. I've been told one time that disabled people shouldn't be allowed to have children. Who said that? A nurse at an ESA assessment. Oh, a nurse. Goodness me. Okay, taking it away no. from that, that is, that is utterly disgusting. Some of the things that have been said, are you okay? Yeah. You're right. But Paul, this is, yeah. the, this is a general message. So I know you, you, you've, you've got to go, and I really appreciate you, you, you being no, here with fine. us this morning and, ta and taking the questions. There's some politicians, and Jonathan's done it, you've done it. Some politicians will not do this. You have done it. Credit to you for that. Are you there? Convince people that you are there for people like Amanda. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely, because, you know, this is why I got into politics. I'm here speaking to you because I was sitting there m muttering at my n newspaper in the 90s, having lost a business in the recession then, and myself as self-employed, as I say. I wanted to do something about it. I cannot do everything, but I will always try. Now, with Amanda, what I would say, I don't know her exact circumstances. She talked about being on a legacy benefit. Maybe see if there's a, if there's a reason why she might not get more money on universal credit. She rightly says that not every disabled person can, can work, and that should that's exactly what the welfare state is there to Go pick on. up to protect. But there are what we've done over the last uh, decade is to allow disabled people who can work to actually have adjustments in their workplace and uh, uh, and be able to get back into work. And there's more disabled people working than ever before. But clearly, as you rightly say, not everybody is in that position. And we shouldn't be making judgments on that basis. We should just be able to help people that we can. How long is Liz Truss going to last? Is she, OK, is she going to lead you into the next election, Paul? Look, I've, what we're doing at the moment, Nikki, uh, is I saw her last night. I've spoke, been speaking to lots of my colleagues. Oh, is, is she? Working through, is working Frazzled. Through the immediate, is make, working through the immediate situation. That's what she's planning to do. She's yeah. planning to uh, do that. But having helped people, right. and we've got a really crucial two weeks now if, to get to that next um, spending What do you think? Will, will, she, will, she, yeah. will she lead you into the next election? Well, if we get this next next bit right, then uh, then I see no reason uh, uh, why not. But we've got to get this next bit why right. Why not? It's going to be difficult. <laughs> well, because, because this is not got, a ringing endorsement. No, well, because I'm just being I'm just being uh, uh, practical with you, Nicky. I'm just trying to be up um, straight for you. This is a difficult time for the party because it's a difficult time for the country, and, and we will be judged on our actions. It's not about warm words. It's not about what I say now. It's about what we do for people now, as you rightly say. That come two years, it's can Amanda, can Kayleigh, can the others actually feel that there's been a market change for them and they can see some prospects for the next five years as think, well? Okay, th turn, have you got to go now? I'm not sure of the timings. It's a, a I've got a few more minutes if you want. All right, well, that's good. Well, Jonathan, we'll let you come back in a second as well. But we want to keep it like the, the public speaking to the politicians as, as much as we can. So, I mean, if I don't give you enough of a shout, shout at me. Um, yeah, uh, well, let's go along the line. There's three hands up here. Uh, Nigel, first off. Isn't the problem simply that the Conservative Party MPs can't reconcile themselves to whoever their leader is? They've all got ambitions to be the leader, and they just, uh, they just cannot rest until, until they are. The, the divisions we're seeing within the Conservative Party are a political problem for the Conservative Party. The, 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 they just can't reconcile yeah. themselves to whoever A lot is. of factions. Uh, Richie, hi. Hi, Anthony. Can I just ask Paul Scully there? With uh, nurses getting a 72 pence a week pay rise, they've got uh, food banks in the hospitals and they've got to pay for the car, car parking. Paul, how about when you, you got a pay rise of £2,000, you get £3,400 towards your energy and you get expenses towards your fuel. How do you feel about that? Are you, you're not concerned about that? Well, I mean, to be fair, I don't because I. No, no, I commute. you do, London, Paul. Uh, no, no, I'm a London MP. No, just let me explain. I'm a London MP, so no, I don't yeah, have you're a. You're on about thing. other MPs, Paul. Uh, yeah, 3,400. All right, let, let, OK, OK. On that point, uh, yeah, you ask the question, just, I'll answer the question. I'll just clarify. But look, I know it's difficult. What, we, the, what happens with public sector workers is that uh, there's obviously a pay review process that goes, goes through that. And sometimes the, the, um, when they do that, they, they are looking at inflation at the time and there's a bit of a lag. So what you tend to find is that um, you may well find that next year it's a different situation when they have their, their, um, their pay review at that point. But what has to happen, the Treasury, when they look at it, is they have to look at the effect on giving 
uh, several hundreds of thousands of people, indeed millions of people, on the uh, public sector purse, uh, um, an inflation-busting pay rise, because that in itself embeds the inflation. So, we try, as I say, we, I've been talking about the fact we're trying to help people now. What we don't want to do is to be under these pressures for a moment longer than we need be. We're expecting inflation to be going down because of the situation with energy and, the, uh, and Ukraine, the tight labour market, cost of goods, um, middle way through next year. If we don't get this right, then that won't go down and it will we'll be in the same problem this time, this time next Christmas. Listen, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Show your appreciation. Thank you. All right, Jonathan, we'll get Jonathan Reynolds uh, shortly. That's Paul Scully. Uh, from the uh, uh, Conservative front bench. Anyway, thoughts on that? We'll get around with some thoughts on that. Uh, Denise, just remind us what you do, Denise Irving. Um, I'm the manager of Citizens Advice in England. Busy at the moment. Very busy, yes. Um, last October, we've seen 323 in our drop-in services. In the first week in October, we've seen 206. Yeah, OK. And so this, this is really shot up. What are people asking you? What are people wanting from you? Basically, um, people are looking for benefit checks to see if they can increase their income because people simply can't afford the essentials. They can't afford um, the, the energy and they can't afford the food bills. And they're just not managing everybody that's pretty much coming through our doors on a deficit budget. Where's this going? serious crisis. We are already in crisis. We've been talking about the heat and eat for a number of years now. Um, we are at a point where people are self-disconnecting and they're simply not putting the heat on or they're going without food. Lots of voices. Uh, Kevin. Uh, hi. I, I wanted to switch tack a little bit. Just, uh, I think there's a real problem with democracy that's happened over the past week in that there's been a coup. I stood for the Brexit party in 2019 because I was worried about the betrayal of the two parties, the people who voted for Brexit. And so Paul, like yesterday, 56% of people... Um, what was it? But it was a huge swing uh, back to uh, Remain. I think 56% of people who voted for Brexit regretted it. I'm sorry if I get it wrong, but it, was a, it didn't look good for Brexit, the particular poll of public opinion. Some people did. I don't, because I think it's important for us to be able to recall our politicians, and we couldn't recall them from Europe. And one of the concerns that I have over the past few days is that there's been a coup. Effectively, Jeremy Hunt is the Prime Minister. He has taken over. He's de facto prime minister. Nobody voted for him. Uh, people voted for Boris in 2019 because he promised to deliver Brexit. And yet we're being totally betrayed by the, the switches around. Uh, besides the terrible uh, aspects that people have been talking about, I think it's a, de a deficit in democracy. OK. Let, uh, who actually rule this got you, country got you. in charge. Got you. We might go on. So, uh, this, this, is, this is about 59% of people think that Brexit has made matters worse, 20% no difference, 14% say that Brexit has made matters better. That was a poll uh, yesterday. Ap apologies for not uh, remembering the particular figures. Let's get lots of uh, voices. We haven't heard from, from you, Andrea. Yeah. Hi there. Hi, good morning, what? everyone. I'm Andrea Bell, the founder of Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. Pretty prominent in the city at the moment. Everybody knows us, everybody's using us. Um, My opinion slightly different to everybody else's because our work's very much in the middle of ping pong of politics. So we, 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 we'd like to sit on the bench because the people we're working with, their lives are impacted by somebody else's decision. They have, no, they have no control. It's only things that everybody else has mentioned. Food, energy, fuel for a lot of the working people that we're helping now. So again, my question to everybody from a probably a peasant's kind of view, is can you just make a decision that actually does some positive for the people that we're supporting? It's, food services have this impression that it's somebody who's of a certain class. It's not. It's working people. It's unemployed people. It's people with addictions, yes. And that, they, they deserve the same support as someone else. So again, can somebody just make a decision that actually makes a positive impact on the people who are having to use our service? Go. Hi, Nicola. It's not super memory, man. People have got the, uh, if you're listening on the radio, people have got their name tags yeah. on. Tell us about yourself. Uh, so I'm Nicola Wood. I've been uh, in, in business in Sunderland since I was 18. So um, I've got a good understanding of our area. Um, as a local business owner, I would like to turn on the TV and not see the constant um, unease and the squabbling. I would like to have one week in my business where I know what my outgoings will be because the price is not 
rising all the time. Um, five years ago, I set up a business that um, helps people when they've lost their hair. And just like the lady was saying there from the soup kitchen, we see I, it, this cost of living crisis is not just about people on the breadline. This is about people who, um, obviously people who lose their hair through cancer treatment, etc. The, You're in the hair business, as I it do, were. Yeah. yeah. So I have. I yeah, what about wigs? People yeah. who. So I own the wonderful wig company. Oh, which, are you? Yeah, right. we serve the whole of the northeast NHS when you lose your hair medically. So these people are already going through the worst time of their life. Then you give them cancer, and all of a sudden they are completely poor. They've got no way to pay for anything. They come to us for a wig, and um, that's. It, everybody's affected. The cost of our wigs has had to go up, but that affects people. Who, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're from a wealthy family or a poor family. If you are ill, that your choices are taken away from you. Yeah, talking about the distance, we're just coming out to the news, but talking about the distance between things, how do you feel, Andrew, the people that you see on a daily basis when you hear that the, the banker's uh, bonus cap uh, is uh, to be lifted and the original idea to lower the rate of tax for the wealthiest in society? Viscerally, how did you react to those policies? Very from, quickly. From my side, there always never seems to be that simple solution. One mm. says one thing, the other says the other thing, and all, all we see at ground level is the impact, as I say, of someone else's bad decision, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We have more to come. You'll notice that uh, the clock is approaching 10. We're going to have the news. Welcome to BBC News. I'm Rebecca Jones. New figures out today show inflation in the UK has returned to the 40-year high it hit earlier this summer. The rate, as measured by the Consumer Prices Index, is at 10.1%. In other words, if you paid £100 for a variety of products in September last year, you're now paying, on average, £110.10 for the same products this year. Some prices went up more than others. Food and non-alcoholic drink rose by 14.6%, even though petrol and airfares went down. Liz Truss will face questions from MPs in the House of Commons this lunchtime for the first time since the almost complete reversal of her economic plan. The local government minister, Paul Scully, has told the BBC that there's no reason why Ms Truss can't lead the party into the next election. But there's a row brewing in her own party over the possibility of scrapping the triple lock on pensions after Downing Street said it was reviewing its commitment to increasing payments in line with inflation. It is a number which will cause concern for uh, a lot of people around the country who completely uh, understand that. It was, uh, it's in the range that I think uh, we were expecting. Um, it could have been uh, higher. I think the uh, the figures, uh, sorry, the, the uh, response to the energy price increases that we brought out in the statement um, a few weeks ago will have helped to suppress some of that inflation. But of course, it is still something which is concerned. I listened to the, uh, the, 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 the things that people are saying about their food bills going up. We completely get that. That's why we want to make sure that we take action to try and uh, limit the uh, rate of inflation. That's why it's so very important that we uh, protect people and businesses, as I say, from those energy price rises. But we also try and address some of the core drivers of inflation, uh, including the uh, the war in Ukraine, which has pushed up energy prices, and that's had a knock-on effect of okay. so many other prices in, in uh, people's baskets. And that was the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly. Let's take a look at some of today's other stories, and an independent panel will this morning publish a report into failings in the care provided to women and babies at three maternity hospitals in Kent. It's expected to describe how newborn babies die because of poor care at East Kent Hospital's NHS Trust. The Trust says it apologised unreservedly to everyone it had failed. The Manchester United footballer Mason Greenwood, who's charged with attempted rape, assault and controlling and co coercive behaviour, has been granted bail following a private hearing at Minsell Street Crown Court in Manchester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
A large crowd has welcomed the Iranian athlete Elnaz Rakabi on her return to Tehran from the Asian Games, where she competed in a climbing event without wearing a hijab. It was perceived by many as a show of support for the current anti-government protests in the country, which were triggered by the death of a woman who'd been detained for allegedly wearing her hijab incorrectly. But Ms Rakabi has denied the claims. And more rail strikes over pay and conditions will take place on the 3rd, the 5th and the 7th of November. That's according to the RMT union. It threatens a week's worth of disruption, similar to previous strikes. RMT General Secretary Mick Lynch accused Network Rail of dishonesty in negotiations. That's all from us for now. Let's return now to our special coverage of the cost of living with Nikki Campbell. Here we come. Welcome back to uh, the fire station. Um, wow. Some, uh, some really, really interesting conversations happening this morning as we talk about the cost of living. We're talking about energy. Brexit has been mentioned. We're in Sunderland. It's a, it's a fascinating part of the world politically. It really is. Uh, and historically, uh, too. Richard, uh, man from the BBC. I do believe. Just remind people who you are. Uh, I'm the political editor for the BBC in this region. Right, so. right. Tell us about this region. Well, it's a region, obviously, that's gone through quite a lot of political change in recent times. We're in a, a Labour city in Sunderland. There are three Labour MPs here. Uh, but, of course, in the 2019 election, Boris Johnson achieved a better result than any Conservative leader had achieved since the 1930s, better than Margaret Thatcher did in terms of winning over people in the North East away from the Labour Party. Uh, so there's been... A, a significant change and, and, and we've heard already in the audience say, haven't we, some, some people who have actually suggested that they, they voted Conservative because they believed in Boris Johnson, who of course now is gone. Carla beside you being one of yeah, them. Yeah, so now, now the, obviously the challenge for the Conservatives in this region is how do they persuade people to stick with them in a, in a series of seats up and down the region they need to win to stay in power at the next general election when the person who achieved this kind of political alchemy really, um, you know, turning people who'd never voted Conservative before in the North East into people who are prepared to do it, how do they persuade them to, to stick with them. Very Brexit. Yeah, I mean, obviously Sunderland, famously that night, it was the, the first place that gave the real indication that the country was going to That's vote. That's when the, 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 the glum faces yeah. started on the, on the Remainers and those glum yeah. faces yes. remained. Yes, yeah. I, was, I was here for that vote that night. Um, uh, now, but of, I, of course, Brexit still matters to people. I don't think, you know, we, I think you did a show of hands earlier about whether people had changed their minds. I didn't see many people who had, I think it was one or two. But, of course, the cost of living issue, which we're talking about now, has, has superseded all that, I think. I don't think the Conservatives can rely on, you know, that, their Brexit policy, if you believe they've got Brexit done anymore, they need to provide answers to the, some of the questions that people have been asking here today, which is how do I get through this situation and, and be able to keep life and limb together? Jonathan Reynolds from Labour, just while we're on that particular topic, Brexit has... I mean, yes or no, it has affected G GDP, hasn't it? Yes or no? Yes, yes. To what extent? 4%? Well, I mean, e <laughs> figures a bit abstract. It, the business investment has gone down. It has been a devaluation in, in sterling. But I don't think, so, to be frank, knowing people who, who did vote for Brexit around here, that it was the economy that was always, you know, there was, there was a lot of different things. You've got to respect that, Nicky, and understand it's not just... You respect democracy, of yeah. course. You do re respect democracy. But if we were to have growth, some people are saying, and indeed, T Tobias Elwood from... Oh, I nearly said from your party. No, he's from the other lot. <laughs> Tobias Elwood from the Conservative Party, he got himself into a load of toxic bother when he said, if you want to have growth we should have some better relationship with the single market and even tiptoe back into the single market. That would be a surefire way to having some growth. He's right, though, isn't he? Well, yes. In a technical sense, yes. But in it, look, oh. in, the, in the uncertainty, right? Technical if you look sense. at one of the outcomes, Nicky, <laughs> there's a lot, the period of uncertainty was also a detriment to how the economy functions. So I, I honestly cannot see how you can permanently have the same argument time and time again. There are things that we could do that aren't about joining the single market. I mean, Canada has a better trade deal with the EU in many aspects. You could do a veterinary agreement. You could mutually recognise qualifications in, in the UK and in the EU. They're more the, fundamental than that, people are saying. Well, I, I don't think getting back into that argument is Gone. to anyone's benefit. Over. Anyway. I think let's, let's move practical things yeah. about how we move this forward. Yeah. Make Otherwise, it work. We will, it will never end. And the other, unfortunately, I've got to say is, until there's a consensus in this country, you know, the rest of you wouldn't, wouldn't want that. So I think you do practical things, you, you make it better. You don't just try and relive previous arguments and never get through them.
Dominic from the Tory from the council, his eyes are sparkling, wanted to come in here. I'm sorry, not just now. Professor Laura Coroneo from York University. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just a general picture on this particular area and um, why it was um, so in favour of Brexit. What was it? Was it a vote of disillusionment? Try something new? Well, at the end, um, it was politically it was easy to sell Brexit as to change something new, and people were tired of the old new of the old stuff and thought that things could only get better, and which I think is uh, a common fallacy uh, of uh, people thinking that uh, you are at the bottom, you can only go up. Um, and but I think it's we, there is no point in talking about Brexit. Well, so uh, sorry. We call them the Madonna mics in the business because yeah. they like that. Just pull it away from you. Yeah. Just rub it. We'll, 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 we'll persist. Anyway, yeah. So the, uh, I agree that there is no point in talking about Brexit now. So we are in a cost of living crisis and we had a serious uh, uh, crisis of credibility in the fiscal policy of this country. So we should really put all our efforts to address this credibility crisis. And this has a cost. So there were like some estimates yesterday from uh, Financial Times and Bloomberg that were saying that at the peak, like this was 20 billion cost. So and now maybe with intervention of the Bank of England, this is 10 billion pounds cost in additional spending for uh, servicing the debt, and which has is just a byproduct of how the mini budget was delivered. How much of it was the mini budget? Because there are huge global forces. The mini going. budget was 45, 000, 45 billion pounds. But uh, um, the problem is that the mini budget was released uh, by passing the OBR, which is the fiscal watchdog. And it is like going to get a loan without having a credit check. So the markets were worried about the fiscal sustainability of these plans and th th they were not willing to buy government bonds. So the prices went down and the government has started to pay like higher interest, which means that the cost of borrowing for this country went up due to the, the fact that the government lost its credibility yeah. on its fiscal plans. And the former deputy governor of the Bank of England and other people have been saying, God, blimey, it's so bad. We're like Italy now. How does that feel for you? <laughs> well, the, the, the Bank of England has been working very hard. It was in a very difficult position because... Well, we were we discussing have... Italian politics earlier on. Yes. Your but... roots and, you know, and what, do, what do you think of that comparison when they're saying, you know, we're, we're on that level now, Italy? What do, you, what do you think when you hear people saying that? Well, when, when the market starts not being sure about the country, of course, if you're not sure about lending your money, you ask for higher rates. And this is what happens. And uh, we always think that we are safe from that uh, uh, scenario, but we are not. So this is why we have institutions. This is why we have the OBR that uh, sends projections for the fiscal sustainability of the plans. This is why we have a Bank of England that is an independent institution that has a, a mandate of 2% inflation. And the government, what did is question this mandate. So which means that as a result of the mini budget, what we are going to have is that we are going to have higher inflation for longer. OK, I understand the economics. Thank you for that. And uh, uh, let me see, where's... Uh, the, with the man who with his drink... Uh, runs, Mick, there you are. It sounded like there's a man there with a drink. And uh, boy, would that be good. Uh, but anyway, you uh, have a drinks business. I do. Tell us about the situation you're in at the moment when it comes to your business, when it comes to your workers. Yeah, we, uh, we run a business called Clearly Drinks. I think in the region, most people fondly remember them as Villa Pop. Oh, yeah. Does anyone Round remember? Applause. Yeah. yeah. There we are. Um, you crowd please are you. We're really yeah. proud. They've been around yeah. for 137 years here, so we're one of the oldest soft drinks manufacturers in the UK. Um, right now, in this absolute chaos, it's a, it's a political pantomime. Um, when you're in the reality of it, right in the heart of it, trying to run a business and maintain it on a daily basis, it's, it's almost impossible. What are your costs then, big costs? Uh, our, our costs have gone up on average in the last 12 months by over 50%. Uh, and that's not sustainable. There's only so much you can do to pass on to your customers, which in turn need to try and pass on to the consumer. And what are the big items that have gone up that are necessary for the proper functioning of your business? Mick? Everything starts with electricity for us. Energy. So my electricity went from 12p a kilowatt up to now 49p a kilowatt in the space of less than 12 months. Mm -hmm. And that is unsustainable. Now, obviously, electricity then has the knock-on to our raw materials that we buy because they need energy to manufacture. So hence why my materials now have gone up by an average of 50, sometimes 
CO2, I can't even get my hands on right now, which is just generated down the road in Teesside, has gone up from £132 a tonne in September last year to now over £1,500 a tonne. And that is not sustainable. When you say it's unsustainable, you say it's unsustainable. What does that mean? It means that, you know, wh what I need to do is ensure that we maintain the security, uh, the job security, you know, the, the financial viability for this business for the long term to last another 137 years. But I'm heavily relying on my customer base, but also our workforce to help us get there. Yeah, what about your workers getting people to do the jobs? We, we struggle in certain areas. I think um, obviously coming out of the pandemic changed the whole labour market situation. Um, I think Brexit definitely has had an impact as well. Um, so we struggle with uh, manufacturing teams, bringing in operatives, engineers uh, for shift working. Um, it's, it's really challenging. Uh, we've got a much higher level of attrition now than we ever have. We've always prided ourselves on having a, a turnover of about 2%. Now we find it very difficult to attract, no matter what package we're offering. So it, it just exacerbates the challenge that we have. Are you going to stay in business? We are. We are. We've got fantastic support. Um, we've got fantastic support from our investors, from our bank, uh, but more importantly, from, from the local community as well. Give us a signal drink that you make that would... Uh... Perfectly clear. Perfectly clear. So if it's, only it it's, were. It's, it's, it's spring water. Um, it's flavoured spring water. You can get it on the shelves in Tesco's and Sainsbury's and everything. Not while it lasts. What a disgraceful be thing on the BBC this is. <laughs> Goodness me. Get it in there. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh. All credit to you. All credit to you for that. Cheers, Another you. word from Andrea, and then we'll get it right. I'll be with you, John, as many people as we can. I want to hear all the voices. Andrea, come back on that. On a non-political side, Mick here supports our soup kitchen. OK, he's struggling like every other organisation, but he makes sure poor people are looked after. Judy, did you, did you want to say something? Um, it's no, it's no denying that the country is in, generally in an awful mess, but I feel that the population and work, the working population could actually do more to help the national cause. At the moment, we have various factions going on strike and demanding inflation-busting wage rises, which, as we've heard, it's not helping businesses, it's not helping the country in general. I think people need to... Do you be... think they should not be on strike? They, should they shouldn't. A... I think we should be realistic about the sort of pay rises that people can expect. Um, this is particularly poignant at the moment when they're actually talking about nurses striking. Um, there is absolutely no way on this earth I would ever even contemplate a such nurse. a thing as a nurse. I didn't go into nursing for money. So this is striking irresponsible at this time, yeah? I think it is. Susan, do you want to... Sorry, I think that as well, given the way things are, when people are having to get to work as well, that means that it's impacting on what they are getting, their earnings, as far as what they've been able to get from A to B. And if they haven't got the money to get from A to B by way of what they are getting, how are they supposed to get there? And plus, I would also say to you as well that those nurse, you nurses did an amazing job in the pandemic. Everybody pulled everything out of the fire in the pandemic. People have a right to expect a decent standard of living, a standard of living. They also have the right to make unhappiness plain, but in a respectful way. And if you're saying that they shouldn't go on strike, well, try telling that to the train drivers, try telling that to the rail workers who are now fearing about losing their jobs Let Judy when come it back. comes through an after that dreaded word of rationalisation. Let Judy come back. <laughs> As a person of a certain age... Um, the same I, age as me, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, I've already lived through this process in the 70s and 80s where there were lots of strikes, the miners went on strike, there were spiralling wages and it just fuelled inflation. And it doesn't help in the long term. I do sympathise absolutely with people on low incomes and people who are struggling, but moderation in all things, it is unrealistic to expect pay rises of 10% when the country's in the state it is. Which is what uh, actually Andrew Bailey, not so long ago, the Governor of the Bank of England was saying. John McKay from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, hi, John. Thank you. Yeah, it's, 
challenging times, difficult times, interesting times, terrible times for people. It's exceptionally difficult, and we've already heard uh, Mick and, and Nicola before him perfectly describe the cost of doing business crisis that our members are talking to us about every day all across the North East. Our brilliant businesses in the North East have come through the, the cost and the complexity and the uncertainty of Brexit. They've come through the pandemic, and now they're dealing with, with this terrible cost of doing business crisis. There are no easy solutions to this, but there are things government can do pretty quickly that don't necessarily cost a huge amount and put a huge burden on the public purse. So, for example, government can start to review business rates. We've seen the inflationary figure for September coming out today. <laughs> Nicola, who runs we've her, seen, we've her seen the inflationary figure thing. coming out today of 10%. Business rates are calculated and, and new rates come into effect from April, and the April increase is based on whatever the September inflationary rise was. So without business rates reform, businesses are going to be facing an extra 10% based mm -hmm. on today's figures when their new bills come in in April. What about striking? So what we need is uh, not just a stronger economy, certainly here in the North East, but we also need a more inclusive economy. But can, more, can the government accede to all those pay demands? We, we, we need a more inclusive economy where more people have access to the economy and can play their part in the economy. Everybody deserves a fair wage for a, for a fair day's work. Absolutely. What does that mean? Yes or no on the, all the strikes. Well, it means so, so. For example, again, other levers that that government can pull that they have at their disposal. For example, on childcare costs. So we know that childcare costs right now are prohibitive. They they prevent particularly young parents from either entering or re-entering the jobs market. So we can, if we're going to if we're going to turn this problem around, we have to do it, do it by supporting our businesses to grow and to create more and better jobs. And the way we'll do that is by supporting those businesses by enabling them to grow. Uh, and that's how we'll grow the economy. Yeah, there's a uh, guy behind you with your hand up for ages, and I'll, I'll come to you in just a second. Um, over there with a, a nice shirt on, three along. Oh, one, two, three. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I was just saying that um, I don't think people can afford to wait for the economy in the long term to stabilise. I think that they need to take drastic action because they can't even, you know, afford to do basic things. And if they don't strike, then they're not going to be heard and the economy won't help them. And, I mean, they can't wait for six months or however long for them to actually get a fair wage because in that time, you know, who knows what could have happened. could get worse. Yeah. Who thinks there should be... Um, the people who are on strike at the moment should just hold their fire at the moment? Who hands, put, puts that, put your hand up if you think they should. They should just look at the situation and say this is not... Yeah. Yeah, personally, I just think striking the more is terrible. I think Mick Lynch from the Real Unions is, I, I tell you what, it's an absolute slap in the face to people um, who are on salaries of less than £20,000 a year. Training conductors and training drivers are on salaries of over £70,000 a year. There are people in this audience right now who are, who are making less, and I just think that's a joke. Personally, I think the cost of living right now, I think, you know, people like nurses as well, I think they're not getting paid like far enough what they sh what they do for the public. I think they should hold the strikes now until the him? cost of crisis is under control. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say that um, there are certain uh, sections of society, like the fire service, the police service, and nursing staff, should never be allowed to strike. But I, I'd like to make one point: there's not been enough been allowed to say today about support for what the government have done for people in this country. I accept that everybody's an individual. Everybody has struggles and strife. I'm a pensioner. I'm on benefits. How do you feel I'm, about the triple pension law I'm, going? We don't know what's going to happen. If it does go, if, if well, it's not in line with inflation. Can I just say what I'm grateful about? You can, yeah. Thank you. I'm grateful that £650 was given out in July. Half of it, 326 was given out. The other 324 comes out on the 8th of November. There's another £300 on top of the winter fuel allowance. That's £500. If you're over 80, you get £600. I have switched a variable account on my energy. My bill came to £67. My bill actually was nil because the government gave me £66 so on the 1st of yeah. October. Yeah, yeah. I'm very grateful for what the government is doing. There are struggles, and I accept that. Everybody's different. But I think there should be some... Someone should say that they are grateful for what the government are doing for certain sections of society. You've said it, Alan. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to come over here. We've got a taxi driver here and we've got a doctor. I'm going to speak to you. I haven't come to you yet and I will do so. And uh, Zaf, right with you. Kevin Peachy from the BBC. Just remind people what you're doing, who you are, Kevin. So I'm Kevin Peachy. I'm uh, the cost of living correspondent covering all uh, aspects of personal finance. Life is busy. Uh, <laughs> striking. It is, it is. Um, 
So there's obviously a lot of a lot of debate over wages, how the effect that has on inflation. I think if we sort of take a step back and look at some of the context here with the rising cost of living, uh, we conducted a, a survey for the BBC of 4,000 people, and uh, it found that 85% of those asked were worried about their finances. 56% uh, said they thought their financial situation would worsen. Now we compare that to a similar survey survey back in January, then it was 30% back wow. then. So you can see that people's concerns are rising. And if we uh, heard from Carla and Amanda earlier, we sort of reassure them, if you like, that they're not in an isolated situation here. Uh, uh, and, and everybody here today is not isolated because it is a national issue and and for like we're example, all in this together but yeah. not in a good way uh, yeah and for example nine out of ten of those asked in our survey said they were delaying putting on the heating something that carla mentioned and and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't put my heating on like i said uh, because i've got the, as the gentleman was saying about the getting the extra money and everything thank god for that or well, thank the government for that because the thing is Otherwise, I, pardon me, I'd be up that creek without a paddle. Yeah, the famous you know. creek. What happens when it gets really cold? Well, I just carry my little heater around wherever I am, or otherwise I get into bed and I sit and I read my book or, or whatever. I don't even put TV on because I can't afford it at the moment. You know, it's... it's, it's was that your expectation when you were going to retire? Or did you expect to retire comfortably? Did you expect to retire with some dignity? I mean, do you expect to be carrying a heater around your room, heating individual rooms, heating no. yourself personally, not turning your TV on, the lady on the TV last night not putting a, a toaster on, a kettle? It's crazy. Absolutely yeah. crazy. And, and people are making excuses for the government. Uh, and, and I, I, I take yeah. into um, account. No, people are saying, people are saying, yeah, okay, great, thanks, you've given us £300. It's my three hundred pounds, my money you've given. It's not come out of thin air somewhere. They've yeah. given, well, they're, they're, well, they're not giving it to me. But they're not giving it to me. But they're getting some money. But so not, there are some. Just a, just a second. But they're not giving it to me. But it's my money, and it's your money. It's everybody's money. It's not. It's not being given out of, out of thin air somewhere. Yeah, but just respond. You are getting help, or people are getting help. Right. There is but, help but there's, out there's, there. There's, but there's not help for everybody. I'll give you an example. Okay. My, my individual Everybody bills. on benefits my, is getting right, help. Okay, I'm not on benefits. Well, there you there's are. There's a massive amount of people. I said there was individual okay. cases. I didn't there's a massive everybody. amount of people here, and I think I think there's, there's obviously Tory councillors in the audience and bad Tory MP on. There are people inside here who are thinking, this is all about people on benefits, OK? I like to think that I'm a professional, I've got a decent salary. I am petrified about my bills. I got I got my notification that I was paying like, <laughs> £200 a month last year for, for, for my gas and electric last year, OK? That's now changed. I'm now getting quotes through now from my current supplier of £890 a month, OK? This government's timed what it's doing now with rowing back from the, um, the, 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 the repayment scheme, what they want to call it. They've rowed back from that to April now, because they know full well in April, everybody's going to go and turn well, the heat off. Labour only gave it's it been... six months as well. well that's so... a, different, it's a different issue, Nicky. They only give it six months, but they always said six months. What they've done here, they've got the, they've got the headlines to say, we've done this for two years. They've been pushing that out for two years. Now they're going to turn it all back in April, and come April, everybody's going to turn the heating off, and we're going to be in the exact same situation this time next year. Uh, Amanda, I'll be with you. Amanda's got her hand up again, but uh, do you want to come back here, Dominic uh, McDonough from the, the council, Tory on the council? Yeah, I mean, what you've just said there. I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you said. I, I, you said you don't want to pay as much tax because you said that's my. You said you said that's my money, and I'm giving it to someone else. What, what, what's your point? I don't get it. I don't mind paying tax at all, yeah. as long as that tax money is spent effectively. But this shower are not taxing people and spending effectively. They're throwing money all over the place without any kind of viewpoint well, no, what, for it. What, what, and that's the, the no, that's the reason it's... why we've had the two-year deal because nobody thought it out before they did it. They did it, they said it, and they've had to roll right. back from it. Let Dominic shambles. respond. Well, what the government is doing is they're putting the price the cap in. We don't want to respond. Well, well, if I can't respond, then... Well, then... You've had your say already. Well, no, you, uh, well, to, be, well, to be fair, well, Simon, you had a fair shot. Let's let him come back, yeah? The government have put the price cap in to try and keep prices down. This is a worldwide energy crisis. I've just been talking about to this gentleman. Ukraine was invaded. We're not getting gas through as much. Gas prices are going through the roof. Energy prices around the world 
are going through the roof. This government has put the biggest, one of the biggest support schemes in place in the world to try and help people. Now, is it perfect? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. But it's the best that we can do at the moment. And, and, and I think it, we're talking huge amounts of money that's been thrown at this as well. But it's also let's, gonna cost, it's also gonna cost a lot of let's money speak that we're eventually to gonna have to pay back. Indeed, let's speak to somebody again who's, really, uh, who's, on, who's on benefits and is really feeling it. And I, had, I saw your hand up there a few moments ago. Disabled Amanda. people aren't getting as much as everybody else. We get less, 150 pounds, 300 at the most if we get the second payment. And we are not getting the 600 and something pound even pensions are getting. We get less than anybody else. Certainly, maybe Universal Credit might get more, which I'm pleased for them. What do you, th yeah, what do you think about the people, all the strikes at the moment, people going on strikes? Are they right to do that? It's a good time too at the moment. The same with the government, too much backstabbing. Um, things aren't settled enough, whether it's the Ukraine or in, and in this country. It's a bad time to change prime ministers. We shouldn't have had Liz Truss in the beginning. And the strikes, well, no, I'd rather get rid of her. <laughs> Even I would have Boris. Um, but um, to be honest with you, the strikes, it's not a good time. They work hard for the money, and I'm really one for working hard, but they have to think about everything, about the whole country, where all the money is coming from. And as a previous business owner, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah hi. Do you want to come? Um, hi, um, so my name is Irish. I'm a student at Sunderland. Um, and I am the EDI officer. Um, and listening to Sorry, the what's fact, that? Um, equality, diversity, inclusion, and listening to the fact that businesses are struggling during this period, the cost of living crisis, inflation going up and everything. Could you imagine how students would feel? I mean, loads of students are working, but loads of students are struggling to pay their bills. I mean, like a lot of landlords have separated bills inclusion, like you get students paying £450 and will still have to pay for water, electricity, gas. And it's ridiculous how they cannot afford to pay these bills. And the government, I mean, like obviously the war and all of the crisis that's going on and how everyone is finding it difficult to afford anything. But you, you like, I mean, like the, the older generations are suffering, the younger generations are suffering. And Looking at the political side of things, you, you would want us to wait two years before we make a decision about our future? You want an election now? I mean... Who I mean, wants I an election now, I would, I, by the way? I mean, OK, let, let me take... There's a guy here. Yes. Thank you very much, Iris. There's a guy here. You've had your hand up forever. Go yeah. on, then. Um, I'm here um, sort of representing kinship carers. Now, I'm a kinship carer. And if... for if the, the cost of living is bad for no... As, as it is, but... For kinship carer, the cost of living is bad twice as much because they don't get no support. Mm. Some council gives them support. And you're saving money. You're saving a government oh, money. Oh, God, I. We, we, we save... I mean, this is, this, is what, this is one of the things that get, gets in your throat, right? You see big, massive billboards all around the county come and foster with us. Pay, 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 they pay these foster carers thousands of pounds, thousands of pounds. Mm. But when it comes to a kinship carer... <laughs> They just say, right, get on with it. You're on benefits, that's it. Who are you Goodbye. caring for? My grandchildren. That's what a kinship carer is. A kinship carer is a person who um, takes the children from, you know, from within the family for no fault of their own, who are bands. You know, they'll come and, you know, they'll have problems and stuff like that. They'll come from broken homes and stuff like that. And they'll, they'll go, in, go into kinship care, but then the councils, they just, right, there you go, on your bike. They don't give you any support, so you're on benefits, basically. Most, most kinship carers are like me, disabled or older, or grandpas and granddads and, and stuff like that. And the seven, the seven councils in the country, thousands of pounds. So what's life like for you at the moment, trying to, trying to get by? Very hard. Mm. It's very, very hard. You know, I mean, you, you'll get the children coming home from school saying, we can, can we go on this school trip, granddad? And we'll say to them, well... No, so we, 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 we critically can't, because obviously school trip prices have gone up, but like everything else has gone up, and they'll come home, you know, no, son, we can't, we can't go. And, you know, and he, the, the poor bands will feel, like, left out, and, you know, that the ones that... The, the, they are pointed out at school sometimes, and, and, it's, and it's all wrong. OK, listen, Tony, thank you. And thank you, Tony, for what he does, because he's absolutely right. <laughs> People like him, one second, one second. On the...
Just a quick one, and we're going to talk about the NHS in just a minute. On the quick one of strikes and what's happening at the moment, the industrial strife that reminds a lot of people of uh, the 1970s. Oh, I wasn't even born in the 1970s, obviously. But uh, do you think the likes of Jonathan Reynolds from Labour Front Bench, who thinks that they should be on the picket lines supporting the workers? Who thinks that they should be? All right, let's, let's take it to you and then you can... Why aren't you, Jonathan? Why is your leader said if you go on the... Essentially, he's going to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but if you're on the front bench and you stand on a picket line, you're for it. Well, the first thing I want to say is the, the average uh, rate of wage growth in the UK is 5.5%. I think you said that earlier. Inflation days hit 10%. So, so people aren't getting inflation-busting pay rises. It's not the 1970s, and it's very important that people remember that. Look, where people are taking industrial action, they have absolutely right to do so, we will support their right to do so. What people need from me is to replace Jacob Rees-Mogg and be this country's business secretary. That's my job, that's what I'm putting out. And also- Why is it mutually get... exclusive? No, it's, it's not, but look, the other message to get across, there are not, for instance, rail strikes in Wales where Labour's in charge. I don't believe there are rail strikes in Scotland where there's a different government in charge. So what we want to try and get across to people is, it's not inevitable. You can get involved and sort these disputes out. No one goes Andy on strike. Andy Burnham easily. was on a picket line. He's one of the most in influential Labour uh, politicians uh, uh, in the country. And he's not trying to become a cabinet minister. He's the mayor, my mayor in Greater uh, Manchester. He, uh, uh, my job is to replace the business secretary and do that. And that's the right message to get out. Yeah, yeah uh, Graham, in a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, well, Seriously, Jonathan, the Labour Party was founded on the trade union movement. See, are you seriously saying, oh, I better not stand on a picket line because I want to become a minister? No, I'm saying... You should be supporting your strike we are, workers, but we are the CWU, them, but I'm saying the, most important the RMT. Thing, the most important thing for Labour is to be the alternative to the Conservatives, or otherwise, this problems, the problems we've seen in the country it's really will go on the moment, and on, it? and that is important to get across, and I will always be there supporting people, taking industrial well, action, recognising the reasons for doing Conservatives so. aren't standing on the picket line. So why did Keith so sack Sam Terry then for standing on a picket line? didn't sack Sam for that reason. That was a different issue. That All right, well... Right, where were we? Um, I'll tell you where we were. You've, you've had your hand up for ages, so we'll take your question, and then we'll go to the NHS. And what? I did say I'd come to you, Graham. There's a lot of stuff going on in my head here. Quick one, Graham. Thank you Striking. very much. Striking. We... Head of the council. I will be on the picket line if my leg allowed me to be on the picket line because the trade unions created us. Uh, we should be supporting our workers for a fair day's pay, for a hard day's work. I do not see why the, the pictorial of having senior politicians on picket lines in any way damages us. I think it would reinforce our standing with the He says he wants workers. to... Jonathan uh, says he wants to replace Jacob Rees-Mogg and in order to do so... He he can't stand on a picket line, is kind of what you said. Well, I think the narrative what? there is that the, the... And I'm not speaking on behalf of my shadow colleagues. Because we're trying to show that we want to be the next government, they're trying to do the, the conscious thing of showing that we're working towards being that next government by doing all the policy planning and, and preparation for it. So the narrative is, let's not get involved in that very, very quick snapshot of... So you, you get it, as politicians say, do you? Yeah, I, I understand why they yeah. wish to have that approach. I don't necessarily agree with it, because I think a different approach would work better with us now, because clearly the real reason for this is 12 years of Tory mismanagement of the economy. And you would say that, because you're on the Labour Council. Uh, I want to do the NHS. I want you to make a very quick point, because you've had, you've had your very hand quick, up yeah. for, since right. right at the beginning. Make uh, it quick. Very quick. My name's Brian Moore, leader of the North East Party. Graham Miller is deliberately stopping a £200 million shipyard from opening in Sunderland, the Pallian shipyard. Harland and Wolfe wanted to use it. You personally stopped it. Why have you stopped apprenticeships being created in Sunderland by stopping the Pallian shipyard from being do you reopened. Know, do you know what? It is an issue, I'm sure, and it's an issue perhaps we can discuss later on. I want to move on to... And thank you for making the point. Uh, no worries there. NHS, uh, Dr Jessica Thompson, oh. tell you... Sorry? It's a complete lie. OK. I've got, no, I've got to be allowed to respond okay, to that. Okay, it's a right, complete lie. The council has had no business come forward in the whole time I've been leader to ask to look at the use of the Pallian shipyard. Not one business come forward with a business plan for it. It's a complete and utter lie what the gentleman's stating and I will not have him say it live without being able to say so. Thank and you've you, done Nikki. it and you've responded, Graham. I hope you're satisfied that you've been allowed to respond, Graham. Are you? Graham? Sorry? Are you, are you satisfied you've been allowed to respond? I do appreciate it. Thank right, you. Right, OK, thank you. Doctor... Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> there is. Um, 
Have you got any herbal remedies to calm everybody down? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, okay, herbal remedies not your thing, obviously. What's going on with you at the moment? Tell us about your, your, your practice and, and, and what you're doing and the people who are coming to you, what they're coming to you for. So I work... A lot um, of mental health stuff, isn't Yeah, there? so I work as a, a GP in, in Gateshead, which is just down the road. Um, and then, so I, I work as a solo GP there, and then I've got an additional role as um, the clinical lead for mental health in Gateshead as well. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing all sorts, and I suppose just listening to all the stories here today, you know, it's all really worrying. And I, I think we've got to remember that this is on the back of, of COVID and, and people's, a lot of people's mental and physical health has taken a massive hit during that. And so we're entering into the winter and we're entering into the cost of living crisis with lower health resilience and that we're already seeing, you know, frequently, frequently we're seeing or hearing from people who have got two jobs or who are missing meals or who are... So what are people saying to you when they come and how do they... Because it's not easy, it, you know, to talk about mental health, yeah. is it? It's not easy to actually go in and say, this is happening in my head and I desperately need help. It's a big step. Yeah. You know, so what, what are people saying to you? Is it something that you're kind of gleaning from them? I see you think, oh, this person might have a specific well, problem. Yeah, or so or I, are they saying to you, I'm depressed? So both, both. So there's an under, you know, there's lots of people with underlying mental health issues who are, who are facing a very bleak winter of, of worry and stress from financial things and, and heating and, and all of the, like, the cost of living problems that we've been discussing here today. But also people are, are developing sort of worry, stress, just because they're just, you know, working really hard. They don't know how they're going to, they don't know how they're going to sort of survive the winter, feed their kids. So we're seeing a lot of new people coming in stressed. And obviously we know that people with sort of with a, a mental health burden or who are, are struggling with their mental health, they quite often are struggling with work or struggling with their physical health. So it's not just, I suppose, um, the mental health aspect of it as well. Uh, uh, I'll be with Th Theresa and Shanaz in a second, but Carla, I want to hear from you. And we have been hearing from him today because what you're saying is so important. Uh, is it um, on mental health? Yeah, I suffer from depression and anxiety. Um, I, I can work, all right. But then there's other times when I just absolutely, I shut down. And I can't do anything. I can't go anywhere. I don't want to see people. I won't answer my phone. It, you know. And then, on top of which, you've got all this this problem about um, having to look after yourself. I've got two cats. Thank God I've got my two cats because sometimes I've been so low that I've actually wanted to do something to myself. Oh my goodness me! Listen, we need okay. we need to like, make sure you get some help and speak to somebody um, as well because it sounds to me like you know I'm, are you are you getting help I'm, for what? I'm, yes, um, I'm lucky that I've got my friends and I've, I've got my my support work, you know, my support group kind of thing. But I feel sorry for this. There must be so many people out there. That haven't got people. I know. And, and Carla, what you say as well is about your cats is so important because for so many people, yeah. their cat and their dog is a lifeline. It's support. Exactly. It's, it takes them away from a, from a lonely place. It's a friend. And the cost of cat food and the cost of dog food, and I know there are... There's that too. There's that too. Uh, and everything. Teresa, tell me about what you're doing. I'm Teresa Graham, practice manager in Gateshead. And um, we have seen the impact of the cost of living crisis on all of our patients. Many of them, they don't have the basics for health. They don't have a roof over their head that is secure. They don't have warmth. They don't have social connections. They're very isolated. They don't have nutritious food and they just don't know where to turn. One of the things that we've actually planned to, to help support our patients with this is a cost of living cafe, whereby we are setting up a drop-in so patients can pop in each month. Um, we have somebody from the Citizens Advice Bureau coming in to advise on energy and all of the ways that people can kind of make the homes more efficient. I'm um, talking about benefits, warm homes, discounts, etc. Mm. We also have Gateshead Carers coming in to support people who are caring for other people. We have our social prescribing link workers and they can offer advice and support and signpost to lots of different organisations. Are you busier now than you ever have been? Busier now than we ever have been. Do you think it's going to get even Absolutely. more frantic? Absolutely. It's becoming so busy and 
patients are coming with problems that are not particularly, you know, it's not always a medical problem, it's actually a social problem. And how do you deal with people coming? You've got a big burden as well with people actually unloading their problems on you. That's not an easy task. You've got, to, you've got a lot to deal with as well. Absolutely, but I think we have good support around us and actually in GP practices these days, it's not just GPs and nurses anymore. We have these additional mm. roles like social prescribing link workers, yeah. where actually they are just a font of all knowledge. They know all of the organisations in the area that can support with lots of different issues. But actually, it's about supporting our staff as well, because they are often going through this as well. Completely, completely. Shanaz, I'll be with you, but just uh, Denise from Citizens Advice. I mean, we are heard, you know, it's heartbreaking. Carla expressed it so powerfully and so well, and Carla is not alone. There are lots and lots of people who are on her road as well. What advice is available? I mean, just anyone watching now, Citizens Advice, what can you give people? We would recommend that everybody starts with a benefit check to see if there's anything they may be entitled to. Um, there is help out there, there is support. We have a, a very strong voluntary sector in the, in the UK and in Sunderland. There's a lot of support out there. Seek help. You aren't alone. There's a lot of help out there for people. But again, they need to speak up and they need to come to us. But we've seen a huge rise in the amount of mental health issues that people are, are, are coming to us with. But you're there to help. You're there to help. Shanaz, I'll be with you, but Sophie... And another hand that's been up for eight. I'm sorry if I can't get around everybody. It's been so busy. So many people have got so much to say. Yeah, there's lots of obviously. Tell us about yourself first. So I'm here. Um, I work with quite a few charities in the area, but I also have a husband who's a teacher and I'm a governor of a, a multi-academy trust in the region as well. And there's been a lot of talk about um, the NHS and the pensioners, but actually I think we need to talk about the young people that are being severely impacted by this cost of living crisis. This is a generational crisis that we are facing. Um, schools have had 12 years of austerity measures. They are feeling the frontline impact of that in terms of mental health challenges, antisocial behaviour, and it is the teachers and the teaching assistants and the staff in schools that are the frontline impact of that. Alongside cost of um, or reduction in cost for frontline services, be it N NHS mental health services, be it um, crime and police services, it is teachers who are facing the real living issues that um, the kids are facing at this moment in time. And Zaf, as a taxi driver, what about your costs? Spiralling. <laughs> uh, the fuel costs have gone up 35, 40 percent. We got a I think just over five percent increase in our fares this year, which doesn't really cover the cost of fuel. Have increase. you got contract work as well? Uh, well, just school contract works so through the through the firm, but um, you know um, that, that that's going to be dwindling as well. I think businesses are, uh, are closing down because of the energy costs and the fuel costs then spiral with your shopping, uh, everything like that, and then your family costs are, are going up and up. You there know, are fewer so. taxi drivers every time I go to when I speak That's, to the taxi a, drivers. It's a national issue. But, it um, is a national issue. Um, but you, you're not going to attract people to it. Does it help you, the fact that you've got more business because there's fewer drivers? You, can, that... only, you can only work so long. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're busy, but uh, it's not like you're earning enough to, to pay your, your fuel bills <laughs> and your energy costs and your, your, the cost of living for your shopping for the house. You're not really saving anything. You're not earning any more than you were in the past because everything's gone up. Hey, Chrissy, how are you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm fine. Tell us about your uh, life at the moment. Um, so I'm a disabled student. I'm studying at the University of Sunderland, studying media production. And um, even though like, I do try and like, keep myself to myself, uh, I, I, do, you know, I, I do relate to a lot of these uh, struggles that people have been talked about because I've went through a lot. Um, someone you know, like me who's a disabled student, I've had to really fight for like things that would support me. So, uh, for example, coming to university, I had to apply for a disabled students allowance, um, and there was quite a struggle with with that. Uh, you know, because um, because of my situation, uh, at first I had to really fight to get taxi support there to and from uh, university. Um, we're You're partially entering, sighted. Yeah. yeah, I'm partially sighted. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've always struggled with that, and I've always um, you know even though I've had support. I've always been struggle. I've always like been afraid to ask for it in times because you know, like Amanda was saying uh, before, there um, people do sort of give you that judgmental look. I've had that through school a little bit, um, and as a student, I've you know, I, I I really feel like the the government needs to basically give us give us a voice more because we are really struggling. Like a lot of we rely on student finance 
which everyone gets different amounts of. I'm lucky enough to get the maximum, but even then, I give quite a lot of that to my mum to support with uh, to support with her needs because uh, she's oh, a single yeah. parent. Um, and I just feel like over the past 12 years, the, the government's really not given us that voice. You know, it's like you know the older generation that have said like younger people they need to be seen and not heard, but we do need to be heard. In the, and in the COVID was a massive blow to absolutely. So, many young so what's what, what are you studying again? Media production. So I'm excellent looking, choice, if I may yeah, say I'm, so. I, I will say I, I am. Actually, I'm, look, I'm looking to go into radio. So yeah, um, yeah. Um, like, Stay off my turf, mate. <laughs> uh, okay, no, that's, that, that's great. Like Steve as well. Hi, Steve. Hi. Um, it was, it was just picking up on a couple of the points I made. Sunderland's got Who a smashing. You, Steve? I don't I'm mean Steve, that rudely. I, many people ask. Um, I'm Steve Dunk, and I work with VCAS, which is Voluntary Community Action Sunderland, which is the infrastructure organisation that supported 300 plus voluntary sector organisations over next year, a 50 year period. So every year we take a survey of what's happening in the voluntary sector so we know where we're going to need to deliver more stuff. And every year we get a 56% rise in the small organisations because the majority of small organisations who see more demands on their services and less income coming in. So that's year on year. COVID had a massive impact on the voluntary sector. By default, a lot of people that are volunteers are somewhat grey around the gills um, because that's life's experiences that have led them to that. We were told and they were told to stay in and they've stayed in. It's really, really difficult for the voluntary sectors to actually bring the people out, the volunteers back into the voluntary sector to actually do more work. So you've got a catch-22. You've got all of COVID, you've got all of the worries I, I, of the world. I do find that as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I think what's happening in the voluntary sector, the third sector, is there is an increase in demand for the services that are on the front line because of the reduction in public spending, but at a time when um, disposable income is going down, so charitable donations are going down, people are having less time to volunteer, and they've got higher baseline costs. So actually, these critical services in the voluntary sector, third sector, are under a real under the cosh at the minute, where probably right now we need them more than ever before because they are propping up the NHS, they are propping up the education. And it's more difficult education. for them than ever. And so that's the paradox. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and what effectively is happening is there is a perfect storm coming for young people in this country who are watching their parents or their grown-ups go through real difficult life choices but they are also at a time where the support networks are shrinking around them, so they are becoming more vulnerable to making the wrong choices in life. We are in a difficult world. What are you doing for people, Shanaz, in that difficult world at the moment? Uh, so I'm Shanaz Stansfield. I'm a practice manager at Oxford Terrace and Rolling Road Medical Group in Gateshead. Um, the issues that we're talking about today aren't new. So I've been a practice manager for 50, 15 years, and we've seen... 50? 15. Oh, it's just about... <laughs> So that happened in the NHS for 43 years. So that, that's, you're incredible. <laughs> no, I think so. But, but the cost of living rises that I almost like exacerbated those issues exponentially. So when we had austerity, we saw the impact that had on people and people's physical as well as their mental health. Then Brexit has had, had a financial impact on people. Then COVID came along and all those things that you're, we could not survive as a GP practice without your support in the voluntary organisations. Um, so COVID came along, um, and, and, the, and then now we've got and, and, and the issues around universal credit. When that when that twenty pounds was reduced, with each of those issues happening, we <coughs> see a corresponding increase in demand in general practice. And that were fifteen years ago, my practice was full of people with a health need. Now my practice is full of actually people with a social need that impacts their health, and we don't have the corresponding social services to support them. And we're looking at those numbers now, so we're dealing with more complexity. We're dealing with bereavement from COVID. We're dealing with almost every other person across the demographic um, of our patients um, having a mental health or, 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 or anxiety type thing. And, you know, so, 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 so there is this issue about uh, a, a preoccupation of GP appointments. But I don't think people understand what general practice does behind the scenes. And behind the scenes, what we're doing is we're supporting our communities. We're addressing this cost of living rises, 
the social prescribing link workers that uh, Theresa talked about, they were brought in to help us with health need. One of our social prescribing link workers, Dawn, spends all her time, literally her full time, supporting people with housing issues. We have Julie, who supports people with mental health issues. We have others, actually, <laughs> nurses in the NHS. Oh, incredible, incredible. incredible. I just want to hear yeah. other... Uh, very, very, very quickly, Jessica, just while you're there. Uh, Ness, governments have to make difficult decisions and tough decisions in the financial, fiscal, monetary context in which we find ourselves for all sorts of different reasons and if they do have to trim the NHS budget is there anything to trim? Gosh no <laughs> I don't think so we're so stretched um, and and that's worrying I suppose. There's somebody right at the back here who has got their hand up I'll just come around and it's uh, Marcia. Hi Marcia how old are you? I'm 17. Yeah have your say. Um, so it was a bit about what the uh, man over there said um, about young people having a voice. So I've only just moved to the area. I've moved from Greater Manchester, um, so I was living in Rochdale. Um, I was part of Rochdale Youth Cabinet and a bunch of other kind of similar things. Um, because I'm just really interested um, in politics and things like that. Um, what do you think about what's happening at the moment in politics? Oh, <laughs> very chaotic. I <laughs> um, think there's been a lot of bad decisions, but um, what I wanted to say was um, when I was in uh, Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham was kind of a lot in contact with the youth cabinet that I was part of and the um, MYP, which is Member of Youth Parliament. Um, he was called Adam Rennie at the time um, and he was conversing a lot with Andy Burnham and they actually created something called R-Pass, which was a bus and a tram pass and it means that from 16 to 18 you get free bus travel everywhere in Greater Manchester and coming back um, to the northeast, it was a very big shock for me when I had to pay so much for travel all the time to school or to clubs. And again, what this uh, girl in front of me said before about like students having to pay, especially for uni, like the fees of accommodation and everything is so much. I think that travel is also a massive thing. So if excellent point, everybody. If new travel. things could be introduced. Okay. Excellent point. Yeah. And yeah, and uh, how are we for time? It's uh, so many people with so much to say. Uh, yeah, Police and Crime Commissioner Kim McGuinness, uh, we can get the microphone over to you now. There is the unfortunate uh, consequence. Some people do cross the moral line. There is more crime at times like this. It is inexcusable, but it is understandable to an extent, isn't it? Look, people living in deprivation are much more likely to become a victim of crime. And, that and is also an to commit fact. crime as well. Because uh, of well, the... mams and dads tell me that what they're worried about is that poverty, deprivation, that, that living without makes their young people vulnerable to criminal gangs who will exactly. willingly criminalise young people, who will wi willingly pull them into uh, their racket to make money so that they can benefit from the cost of living crisis. But... My view is that we have got to be much better at preventing this. We've talked an awful lot about this financial crisis. It is a crisis. People are feeling it every single day. What we now need to be doing is investing in those young people, investing in family services, youth services, so that people have the support around them to be able to have that aspiration. This place is brilliant. We've talked a lot about you know, the, the negative things that are going on in this country at the moment. This region, this place has got so much going for it. The people here are aspirational beyond belief. They do incredible things, but they are being forgotten about. And so we need investment in those public services. We need those voluntary sector organisations to be properly funded so that we can prevent crime, prevent mental health crisis okay. and give people the support that they need. OK, everyone put your hands down on the issues that we've been talking about. I only want hands up for people to tell me what is brilliant about Sunderland and what is brilliant about this part of the world and we're going to whiz around you and get a thought from all of you. What's, what's fantastic about this place? That in times of trouble the people in the North East absolutely pull together. I have never seen such kindness in people's hearts as I've seen the last couple of years. Who else? Um, yeah, yeah, Graham, what's brilliant about this place? The people. I've lived here 30 years and the people in Sunderland are great. OK, what's brilliant about this place, Nigel? The community and the ability to regenerate and be positive. James, just a word. What's brilliant about uh, The young people. They're absolutely incredible and resilient. OK, John? Making North East England Chamber of Commerce has worked with the voluntary community and with the private sector to produce an employer's financial wellbeing toolkit so we can get direct support and advice and tips to employers to help their, their, their workforce through this difficult period. OK, what is remarkable, amazing and unique and heartwarming about this particular part of the world? Steve? You've touched on it already. It's the people that have got in the voluntary sector, the, the people who went out in COVID and actually delivered stuff to people, 
the small voluntary sector groups who survive on less than £10,000 a year, which is around about 30% of the voluntary sector organisations in Sunderland who get very little support. They're absolute stars. Amazing people. And, and the Sunderland Football Club. The Sunderland way. Football Club. <laughs> yeah, the most amazing thing. They've had their moments. <laughs> And yeah, just just a positive, Andrew. You run the soup. You run the soup kitchen, isn't it? I the do, food kitchen. Yes. Yeah. And we're the and positive side of poverty. We're dignified. We don't ask loads of questions. We're what people like here? Do you know something? We're hardworking people, but we get the job done. We've got lots of people. Behind us. I'm going to ask a politician what the people are like in his neck of the woods, and I know he's not going to say, well, they're a bit iffy, uh, but, but listen, it, it, it is a place with incredible heart. Jonathan Reynolds. It is an incredible heart, but also incredible industry, incredible history. I mean, there are things like the Nissan car factory in this area that are not just, you know, nationally world-renowned, but you know, world-class, and that's what we can do. But also, you know, I'm always proud to say I've come from Sunderland because of how people like this have reflected how, how passionate they are about the area and what it means to them. Yeah, and all sides of the argument as well. Here's, an, here's the other side of the argument, in one sense, the political argument. I'm just trying to get a microphone to you. I'm going to have to walk along the aisle here like an annoying person in a cinema. <laughs> Uh, Dominic, what's, what's a brilliant about Sunderland? It's the spirit, the spirit of this city, the spirit of these people. You know, we're the best place in the world, let's be honest with you. Oh, hang on. Oh, we are, hang on. <laughs> Come on, let's we not also... take it. It's a great place, let's not take it too far. You've not... Edinburgh, <laughs> yeah. We also have a football team who, who sometimes perform now and again, but we also have the best beaches in the UK as well, but don't tell any Southerners because we don't want them to come up and uh, spoil yeah. it. How about there? What's, what's great There's about this place? The support the schools are given with, with what they've got from the government. They're doing the best they can, which really helps us. Yeah, the best they can, which really helps it. And, uh, yeah, um, Chrissy, uh, what do you love about it here? For me, I always say this, uh, the arts. I feel like the arts in Sunderland are really underappreciated. We've got great theatre, we've, we've got a great music scene, and I just feel like the arts in Sunderland, uh, if you ever come here... Uh, it's what you need to see. And there's a lady... You had a very... Lady back here, Kerry. You had a very spirited exchange with uh, Paul Scully, who was kind enough to join us, the Conservative front bencher, and you were quite angry. Don't be angry anymore. Be, be positive. Be positive about this place. What is it about where you live and where you grew up that you love so much? What is it? Well, I'm from Teesside, so I've got to say a par more. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to... Uh... We're going to... Listen, um, we're, in our, we're in our final minute now and there are huge challenges. And I want a last word from Amanda, who gave us such a picture of her life and her struggles. And you need all the support you can get right now. Um, are you getting enough? No. No. This, the government needs to give more people that, who are disabled, not just myself, but other people, more help. We don't want to be off work. We want to do more. But if you just can't do it, you can't do it. And it's frustrating and less looking down on us. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for your time this morning. <laughs> Thanks for taking part. That's all we've got time for. But what a great audience you've been. Uh, wonderful contributions. Sorry.